Okay, we are live. <clears throat> well, life is good. I pray that first the Lord Jesus purifies my heart, the desires of my heart, that what I desire will be pleasing to him. That's first. That the Lord Jesus will help me to become holier, more pure, more righteous, more worshipful, to love Jesus Christ perfectly, to worship him perfectly, to obey him and to serve others for the sake of Jesus. And I mean that, <clears throat> to help me to get healthier, to lose the remaining excessive fat, and to let me see my girls grow up to be godly women, love with Jesus, and to be in their lives until Jesus takes me home. And last and least of all, if the Lord wants me to be celibate, his will be done, right? <clears throat> because the only perfect relationship will be that in heaven. But if the Lord is pleased for me to find a godly partner, to make her known sooner than later. So those are my desires in Jesus' name for the glory of Jesus. So thank you. So thank you for that. Anyway, folks, the reason why I'm on later than normal is because until, by the grace of Jesus Christ, opening a door of blessing and I find my own place, <clears throat> you guys know I'm at my brother's uh, home, and so I can only live stream when they're not here. So they're not here. So sometimes they're not here in the daytime. Sometimes they're not here in the evening. And right now, it should be 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, right? It's 8 p.m. in New York, Canada. For those of you guys from New York, Canada, is it 8 p.m.? Thank you, guys, that you're with me. I need your love. I need your support. I need your prayers, right? Okay. So just remember... If you're 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 8 p.m. New York time, Canadian time, I'm two hours behind you. I'm six, six o'clock. So <clears throat> the house is empty now, so I have it for a couple hours. So you're going to have to bear with me until I find the place. Pray I find the place sometime near the end of December. I don't want to find it now because my other brother won't be here until the end of December. And if I find a place now, that means financially the burden will fall on me. Whereas if he's here, he'll help me share the financial burden because he'll be working and I'll be doing ministry. And hopefully by the grace of God, the Lord Jesus provides overabundantly so I can be situated on my feet and take care of my girls because they need me to provide for them as well. So please pray. Yeah, Robin, you and me both. One thing I can give you, I'll, I'll give you advice, Robin. And I don't want to denigrate the mother of my children. Do pray for her. Pray Jesus convict her and the Holy Spirit is a fire in her bones and her heart to break down and repent. Turn to Jesus truly repentant and live for Jesus Christ and not follow this path of destruction. Because not only is she going to destroy herself, but affect my kids. But the Lord had given me enough, enough red flags. I shouldn't have married her. But you know how it is. Your will becomes God's, God's will, and you see things that you think is from God. But I can't regret it for one reason. You know why? The two greatest blessings of my earthly life, the greatest blessing is to be known by Jesus and to know Jesus. But the two greatest blessings of my earthly life, meaning apart from being set apart to know Jesus and be in love with Jesus, are my daughters. I could not ask for more beautiful girls than my daughters, right? Yeah, Sai Christian knows my story. By the way, for those of you who don't know, Sai and Christian and I, we are actually very tight. He's family. He's another guy that I consider to be my family, a brother. This guy knows what I went through. And do pray for him too. Without going into too many details, this brother has it hard too. Pray God bless him and his six children. Pray God preserve him and his children. Pray God have mercy on him and give him the grace to walk in holiness and love Jesus. He's got it rough too, me and him both. And I'm not privy to disclose any more details, but keep praying for this man. Even though he can really get me upset. If there isn't one individual, one individual who really can get me upset, it's this guy. This guy, dude, he makes me want to lose my temp testimony and gives me more reasons to get on my knees at night and ask God to forgive me. But that's because he loves me and I love him. I love to hate him and I hate to love him. No, but pray for him, honestly. Yeah, we did go for it. But say, Christian, let's be realistic. And I don't want to, we're going to get to the topic. 
the Bible does say, look for a woman who sold out for Jesus, but that you'll also be content with physically. So, folks, let me just put it this way. God is not telling you marry someone ugly. And even though someone may be ugly to you, that person is going to be beautiful to someone else. See, this is the beauty of God. I'm ugly to many women, but there are some women who think I'm drop-dead gorgeous. Some women are drop-dead gorgeous to me, but others say they're ugly. See, that's how God works. But one thing you'll find in Scripture, let me reinforce this. One thing you'll find in Scripture, beauty is not looked down upon. Beauty is praised. Good looks are praised. Absalom was praised for being good-looking, right? <clears throat> Sarah was stunningly beautiful. <clears throat> Rebecca was stunningly beautiful. See, the patriarchs didn't go for plain-looking women, plain Jane. They went for lookers. They went for stunningly beautiful women, but not that, not at the expense of godliness. They found women who are godly and beautiful. Right? And glory to the, our triune God, glory to the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. There are stunningly beautiful women who are godly. The problem is there's too much competition because there are a lot of good looking Christian men, and there are Christian men who are bodybuilders. So they have a six pack and I have a keg. So I got too much competition. <laughs> All right. <laughs> you with me there? <laughs> Yeah. Is that clear? Yeah. No, Nada, that's over. Nada, I don't want to go into too many details because I don't want to give the impression I'm slandering her. Nada, two adulterous affairs and verbal abuse for 10 years. Pray for her healing. She is not whole and healthy to be in any relationship because she can't last in any relationship. Pray God have mercy on her, convict her, that she's truly healed and transformed. By the grace of Jesus, but no, that ship has sailed. Uh, biblically, I am free. It's not one, but two affairs. I went back the first time for the sake of my kids, and it was wrong. I didn't go back for her. I went back for my kids. Jason, I can testify to you. I do have my moments of anger, angry because of the damage it has done to my children, angry in that it robbed me of my children. Because for two years, my children wondered why I wasn't home to put them to sleep. And I had to lie to them in the beginning. So there are moments in which my heart gets filled with anger and rage. And right away, I say, please, Father, please, Lord Jesus, please, Holy Spirit, heal my heart to forgive her for your sake. And do forgive her because I can't do it in my strength. I can only do it in your power. But for those few times that... I think about it because if I think of my kids, that's when the anger comes in. I can tell you with the Lord bearing witness to this. Jason, listen, I can tell you with the Lord bearing witness to this. I've never be, been more at calm, at peace. I've never felt more love and joy and contentment from God than I, than I do right now. God has shown up. In an amazing, mighty, miraculous way. See, I've told people this. God gives you the grace that you need when you need it. See, people wonder, well, what's going to happen when I die? Can I handle death? Well, the reason why you think about that right now is because you're not dying. But when death comes knocking at your door, that's when God is going to show up in such a miraculous way. He's going to fill you with such peace and joy, you're going to laugh at death. He gives you the grace that you need when you need it. And I've seen it. He's given me an abundance of grace. Yeah. So anyway, pray for her. Let's not talk about her. Let's talk about the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit, okay? Let's begin. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. First again, Father, we just praise you for who you are. We praise you for your son, the Lord Jesus. We praise you for your Holy Spirit, the gift of sending your son to redeem us, the gift of pouring out your spirit to seal us for your glory. And Father, we ask that you forgive us for our shortcomings and perfections and for indulging our flesh, crucify our flesh, save us from our flesh and fill us with fruit from the Holy Spirit, life and power from your Holy Spirit to walk in the spirit and to become more like Jesus Christ. 
and to worship you more perfectly, to love you more passionately, and to live for you more faithfully. And Father, bless this session. Please, Father, by the power of the Holy Spirit, enable me to recall the scriptures correctly and interpret them perfectly. Save me from confusion, from stammering, from error, from stuttering. And Father, bless your people. Give them wisdom and knowledge, insight from your spirit that by the fire of the Holy Spirit purging us and sanctifying us, we'll fall more passionately in love with you and stand more in awe of your word and cleave to Jesus and to his cross, which is our victory and our hope. Cover us with the blood of Jesus. Cover my daughters with the blood of Jesus and plant us firmly in your word and provide our daily provisions and destroy our fears, our doubts, and save us from this corrupt legal system, Father. And have your way in this session. Sanctify my motives not to do it for the praise of men, but for the glory of Christ. And save me from being unnecessarily offensive and bind up the evil spirits, unclean spirits and their children from distracting us. We need you, Father. We love you. We need you and we love you, Lord Jesus. Our family needs you. My children, my daughters need you. We need you and we love and depend on you, Holy Spirit. And my daughters need you. Seal us for the glory of Jesus in Jesus' name. Yahovah, Father, Holy Spirit. Right? Okay. Hit that like button and we're going to talk about Hebrews chapter 1, verse 6, as I promised last night. Again, I need your prayers. I need your prayers that the Holy Spirit will grant me further illumination into the Scriptures, to go deeper into the Scriptures, to find even more treasures in the Scriptures, wisdom and knowledge from the Spirit, to see the beauty of the Scriptures, so that then I can share that beauty with you and continue to teach you as long as the Holy Spirit sanctifies me, keeps me holy, and gives me the health I need to glorify Christ. And pray that the Lord will never allow us to shame Him or fall away but to be covered by the blood of Jesus and to pray for the provisions, right? Again, I want to just remind every one of us, the Lord doesn't need me, doesn't need any of us, but he uses us, and it's an honor to be used of Jesus Christ. Praise his holy name, amen? Now, with that said, I'm going to continue where we left off last night. I had promised every one of you, that we're going to take a deeper look into Hebrews 1.6. So pray for me for clarity of thought and speech, and that I won't confuse you, because what we're going to discuss tonight is the proper exegesis and meaning of Hebrews chapter 1, verse 6. What does it mean for Jesus Christ our Lord to be called the firstborn? Because that's one of the objections of the Jehovah's Witnesses, that Jesus is the firstborn of God, meaning the first creature of God the Father. What does that title mean? When Jesus Christ is said to be the firstborn of all creation or God's firstborn, what does it mean? What it, what doesn't it mean? And I'm trusting the Spirit to guide this conversation, right? So are you got, ready? Are you focused? What was his response, King of Kings? Oh, that was it? Yes. King of Kings, this is a reminder again. King of Kings. Do not think for a moment that these arguments will guarantee that Jehovah's Witnesses will leave and become Trinitarians. No, no. As one Christian scholar said, if it was based on evidence, historical, textual, archaeological, scientific proofs, the whole world would be Christian, fall in love with Jesus, <clears throat> and trust in the Bible. It's not evidence it's the holy spirit taking a heart that is dead full of sin and rebellion refusing to accept god as he is and opening that heart and filling that heart with love and faith right so i don't want you to think these arguments are going to guarantee that joe's witnesses are going to come in droves no that's like someone asked me yesterday how many joe's witnesses have you seen come to jesus christ through your apologetic to be honest nobody None that I'm aware of. Nobody. Right? Does that mean my efforts, our efforts are in vain? No. Let me tell you why. Number one, I'm not doing it for conversions. I'm doing it as an act of worship because God tells me to evangelize. So whether I see people converted or not, I'm obeying the Lord as an act of worship and evangelizing. That's number one. You with me there? Number two, I trust the Holy Spirit for results. I may be planting a seed, 
I may be watering a seed, or I may be harvesting what someone else has so sown, right? I don't know what role I'm playing in a person's conversion or lack thereof. I may be witnessing to someone who's been already witnessed to by 20 people before me, or I may be the first one witnessing to that individual. So follow with me. I may be planting the seed. I may be watering the seed that has been planted, or I may be reaping what has already been sown. Right? You with me there? So don't be frustrated. If you're in the numbers game, then witnessing to Muslims, Jews, witnesses will be frustrating. But if you're in it because Jesus says, if you love me, keep my word. And one of my commands is preach the gospel to every creature. So Jesus, I love you. I'm going to preach whether I get people saved or not by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's up to you. I'm just going to do it because I love you. Yeah, Sai Christian, you were there. Sai Christian was with me in downtown Chicago when I was witnessing to those young ladies and showed them that Jesus is identified as Jehovah because Jesus claims to be the first last. Hey, you know what, Haterwood? Every time we banter back and forth, there is not a day in which I don't get a comment from someone, Haterwood, saying, what happened to you and Haterwood? You guys ain't friends anymore? What happened? I thought you guys were brothers. Why did you turn against each other? See what you're doing? You're making me look worse than you, and that's impossible because no one can look worse than you. And I'm talking about physically and mentally. You're right. By the way, if if ugliness was a sin, then David Wood has committed the unpardonable sin. You don't get uglier than him. It's the grace of God that his wife was blinded to think he's, and he's proof what I just said earlier. Remember what I said earlier? To you, someone can be ugly, but to someone else, that person is beautiful or handsome. You don't get uglier than David Wood. He makes Freddy Cougar look like a GQ model. And yet his wife thinks he's God's gift to masculinity. You know that's grace. <laughs> you know that's grace. God graced this man to blind his wife to think he's attractive. <laughs> Anyway, Haterwood, in Jesus' name, I want to see you in a couple of weeks. Right? We're going to potty. Yeah. And isn't it amazing? I can barely get 200. He does a live stream. He gets 1,000. And he never announces to people, hey, go to Sam Shamoon's heretical YouTube channel so that he can brainwash you with more heresy. What a hater, dude. Hey, David, if your face ain't hurting you, it's killing us. Anyway, may God keep you perfectly healthy and preserve you for his glory in Jesus' name. With that said, are we ready to get into the discussion? Hey, by the way, folks, if David Wood, Vocab Malone, and me could make it as apologists, we surely would make it as comedians. In fact, I'm the best stand-up comedian but sitting down. All right. With that said, let's begin. Are you ready? Hebrews 1.6. Hebrews 1.6. Let me give you the links to the articles, folks. You're going to need to save the articles, and God willing, I'll put the links in the description box. But here are the links to the articles, okay? Here are the two articles that we're going to be using for this session. Save the links, click on them, and follow along in Jesus' name. Here you go. That's one. Here's the other one, okay? So make sure you click on the links. Read the articles, use them in your witness, and pass them on to others. Here it is. These are the two links, okay? Okay, now, let's look at the New World Translation of Hebrews chapter 1, verse 6 one more time so we can get the ball rolling. Hebrews 1, verse 6. Thank first, last, Protestant, and the other admins for helping us, for helping me to help you. The Lord bless them and bless everyone. All right. Hebrews 1, verse 6. We're using... The New World Translation of the Jehovah's Witnesses. But when he again brings his firstborn into the inhabited earth, he, God the Father, says, let all of God's angels do obeisance to him. Do you see the rendering of Hebrews 1.6 in the Jehovah's Witness Bible? Because the Jehovah's Witnesses do not believe it's proper to worship Jesus, they rendered the Greek word proskeneo, the Rasmian butchering of the Greek, 
proskuneo, not as worship, but as doing Jesus' obeisance. In fact, I didn't even know what this word meant. I had to look it up in a dictionary because who speaks like this anymore? At least with the King James, we know it's a 1611. It was, it was translated 1611. It's a 17th century production using the English at that time, right? But why would a translation translated in modern English use a word that I don't know of anyone who employs it? See, we expect the King James to be in Shakespearean English because it was translated in 1611, 17th century. But if you're translating a Bible today in modern vernacular, why would you use obeisance? When's the last time you've heard someone, a native English speaker, use the word obeisance? Anyone? Right? Because this is a modern translation, and this is their updated version, 2013. It is obvious that they chose this word because they want to hide the fact that the Bible commands angels and creatures in general to worship Jesus Christ. See, even Scott Weldon, whose mother tongue is English, is asking me what it means. Obeisance means to reverence or honor, to honor someone by obeying him. See, Scott Wel Weldon, mother tongue is English. He doesn't even know what obeisance means. Obeisance means that you show reverence or honor to someone by obeying him. Right? Respect. See? So obviously, they're trying to obscure the fact that Jesus is worshipped as God. But here's the problem from them, folks. As I stated yesterday, I'm going to take my time and make sure that I'm helping you by letting me know you're getting the point and I'm not losing you. At times... This is going to be very entertaining. At times, I won't be entertaining you because the goal in the sessions is to educate you to know the Word of God more perfectly, fall in love with God, the triune God with Jesus more perfectly, and stand in awe of His Word. That's the goal, right? That's the goal. So I may not be entertaining, but that's okay. If you want entertainment, you can go and listen to David Wood. Because there is no substance in his videos. It's just entertainment. Okay. But anyway. Or even worse, you can go listen to. Well, I forgot his name. Anyway. Well, let's let's focus. Man, I, because I drink so much coffee, I got coffee stained teeth. Don't hate me. Okay. I'll get them white eventually when I get to heaven. All right. The problem with translating Hebrews 1.6. The problem with translating Hebrews 1, Hebrew 1, 1.6 as let all the angels of God do obeisance to him. Here's the problem, folks. Is that this is a citation from the Old Testament. This is an Old Testament citation. As I stated yesterday, I'm going to repeat it again. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 5 to 13, quotes a slew of passages from the Old Testament to make the point of describing Jesus as being infinitely superior, infinitely better, infinitely greater than all the angelic host, all angelic spirit creatures. That's the point of chapter one, to show you that Jesus is superior to every and any spirit being that's created, to any and every angelic creature. So the author cites a series of Old Testament citations. Now, interestingly, the author of Hebrews, which tradition says was Paul, and I believe that tradition. In fact, even James White believes that Paul used Luke to write Hebrews because the Greek style of Hebrews is quite similar, if not identical to the Greek of Luke and Acts. It's very polished, high-level, sophisticated Greek like Luke and Acts. So even James White recently, I heard him say that he believes that Paul had Hebrews written by Luke. And this was the view of the church, that Paul wrote the letter. When, when we say Paul wrote the letter, we don't mean he personally wrote it, but had someone write it on his behalf under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Daryl Denzinger, then you have not studied the Greek of Luke and Acts and compared it with the Greek of Hebrews 
to see that the theology is Paul, but the style of writing is Luke. And if Luke is not telling you what Paul's theology is, then no one is because Luke is Paul's protege. So now, Daryl Denzinger, because you just pontificated and you said something, can you read the Greek of Hebrews and the Greek of Luke and Acts? If I give you the Greek right now of Hebrews 1, can you read it aloud for us? Can you? Answer quickly. I don't have time to waste. No, it's not I'm bucking because I want to teach brothers and sisters in Christ, please, for the love of the Lord, let's all be humble, and I'm preaching to myself. Let's not pontificate and assume we know the issues if we haven't really taken the time to study. See, Daryl, thank you, brother. Because of Captain Ron interceding, I'm going to be gracious and mercy to, merciful to you because that's what I want the Lord to do. Please, brother, please don't pontificate and make a claim if you haven't studied the issue in depth. I'm not trying to embarrass you. Believe me, I'm not. I'm trying to help you. Know your limitation. Be humble about your limitation. Do not pontificate, please, brother. And I'm saying this to help you, honestly, right? I'm not a scholar of Greek. If I pretend to be, shame on me, okay? I'm not. But your argument proves too much because Daryl Danzinger, let me share some with you. Liberal critical scholars use that very argument to prove Paul did not write 1st and 2nd Timothy or Titus. Do you know why? First and second Timothy and Titus, because they say there are words in those epistles never used by Paul in his genuine writings. There are certain words, over 40, that do not appear in the so-called genuine letters of Paul, and the style and the theology differs from the other letters of Paul. So using your logic, you just debunked Pauline authorship of First and Second Timothy and Titus, even though those letters claim to be written by Paul. Because what you fail to appreciate, and I want everyone to know this, is that when we say a letter is written by an apostle, we do not necessarily mean that Paul or Peter wrote it with their own hands. What it means is this is a letter that's authored by Paul, but using a scribe. Oftentimes, you'll find in the New Testament, and this was common in the first century, where a person would have an amanuensis, a scribe, write a letter on his behalf, and then he would sign it off, giving his seal approval that what this scribe wrote has my imprimatur. Are you with me there? So if you have Paul using different scribes, that will account for the difference in vocabulary because Paul would give the scribe certain freedom to communicate Paul's point using that scribe's particular way of writing. And it would be all inspired by the Spirit. Are you with me there? You follow with me? So let me repeat this point. This is crucial, crucial that you understand how the New Testament was written. When it says an epistle of Paul, don't necessarily assume that means Paul wrote it with his own hand. What it means is that Paul is responsible for the epistle, supervised its production, but may have used a scribe to write it for him. Can I prove that to you? Go to Romans 15, 15, as the Lord Jesus enables me to recall the passages. So please, brothers and sisters, don't pontificate on something that you haven't spent enough time studying in depth. And if you don't, read the original languages. I don't read the original languages. I'm able to work with the original languages, but I'm dependent on scholars. And I don't just listen to one scholar of, let's say, the Greek New Testament. I try to listen to a variety of scholars who know the Greek New Testament and see where there's commonality, common agreement, and where there are differences. 
and trust the Holy Spirit to guide me into all truth. Now, Romans 15, 15, Paul is speaking. Yes, Stephen Baptiste. The scribe is also being inspired by the Holy Spirit. Inspiration is not limited to the apostle. You know how I know Stephen Baptiste? Because if only the apostles were inspired, Luke wasn't an apostle. Mark wasn't an apostle. That means their gospels can't be scripture. Inspiration of the books of the Bible is not limited to an apostle writing a book, but that these books are written during the apostolic period when revelation and inspiration is occurring. You with me there? Am I making sense? Let me repeat that point again. Inspiration is not limited to the apostle, right? Inspiration occurs during the apostolic period when the apostles and prophets are functioning because it's at that time that revelation and inspiration is taking place. But that revelation and inspiration is not limited to the apostles because there are also prophets working with them who are inspired and receiving revelation and their companions like in the case of Luke. You with me there? Now, Romans 15, 15. Notice what Paul says. Who wrote this letter, Paul? Romans 15, 15. Who wrote this letter? However, I have written to you, Paul speaking, more outspokenly in some points, so as to give you another reminder because of the undeserved kindness given to me from God. So Paul says, I have written to you. But then Romans 16, 22. Romans 16, 22. Watch here. The Lord anoint the sound of my voice to be pleasing to your ears. I, Tertius, who have done the writing of this letter, greet you in the Lord. Wait. Paul said he wrote it, but then in the next chapter, some scribe named Tertius said he actually wrote the letter. So who wrote it? Who wrote Romans? Tertius. But who was he writing it for? Paul. So is it Paul's letter or is it Tertius? It's Paul's letter written by Tertius on behalf of Paul under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Did you catch it or no? Do you guys see that or no? Who wrote the letter? Not Paul, nada. No. Romans 16, 22 said, I, Tertius, have written this letter. But in Romans 15, 15, Paul says, I have written to you because there is no contradiction. It is Paul's letter written by Tertius on behalf of Paul by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. That's how inspiration works. So what if Paul then used Luke to write Hebrews? This would account for the different literary styles of these productions. Though all of these writings are from Paul, they're not all written by Paul or by the same scribe, accounting for the differences in vocabulary and terms. I can't believe. Only an Assyrian would ask me a question. Why would Paul not write his own letters? Hold on, hold on, hold on. I love you, Zena. You're going to make a perfect wife for an Assyrian Christian because you're going to make him pray that the Lord's second coming is sooner than later. Hold on, hold on, Zena. You know I love you, sister. Huh? People are going to get angry with me. Hold on, let me call. Give me a call. Hey, Gabriel, how you doing? Yeah, how's it going in heaven? I know you got like church in heaven. It's beautiful. Yeah, I kind of miss you, man. You need to visit more often. Can you let me talk to Paul real quick? Yeah, the apostle. I got a sister on, on earth that wants to, needs a, oh, he's kind of busy. He's worshiping with Peter. Can you just tell him one second? I promise it's a second. Yeah. Hey, Paul, what's up, man? Man, you know, you're my hero. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How's Peter? Is he still like, you know, kind of hard-headed? Oh, no, he's, he's sanctified now. Yeah, you're right. Hey, Paul, man, I got this sister. You know, the Ninevites, you know, the people that Jonah was sent to, but he didn't want them to be saved because they're like brutal warriors. Well, man, you should see some of our women today, Paul. 
nothing new under the sun. Everything the same. She even she even goes by name Zena, Princess Warrior. Woo! You thought you think Ronda Rousey's bad, but anyway, the sister wants to know, Paul, why didn't you write your own letters? Come on, Paul. Oh, on that day, you're kind of tired from all the fishing. And then even though you want to muster up the energy, a mob chased you and stoned you and left you for dead. So you really didn't have any energy to pick up a pen and write. That's why. Okay, Tamal. Hey, I'm sorry to disturb you. Enjoy your worship because I'm going to tell her, right? Love you, Paul. Take care. Okay, Zena, he said that because he was on a fishing expedition. Okay. And then after he came back, he was kind of tired, but then it didn't help when a mob chased him and stoned him, leaving him for dead. So he really didn't have any energy to live. <laughs> Better question. <laughs> Better question, Zena. Why should he? Why must he? He could write it or he can have someone writing for him. Why ask me, why didn't he write it? The fact is, that's how he chose to write using a scribe. Is that clear now? Just want to make sure. Okay, now, 2 Peter 3.1. 2 Second, Second Peter 3.1. Okay, let's see what Peter says. How many... How many letters did Peter write? 2 Peter 3.1. Beloved ones, this is now the second letter I'm writing you in which, as in my first one, I am stirring up your clear thinking faculties by way of a reminder. Do you see what Peter just said? He wrote two letters. He goes, this is the second letter I wrote, as in my first one. And the second one that I wrote, I'm reminding you. However, you know one of the arguments by liberal critical scholarship? against Petrine authorship. One of the arguments that liberal scholars use to prove or try to disprove that Peter wrote 2 Peter, you know what it is? The Greek of 2 Peter is so different from the Greek of 1 Peter, it is impossible that the same person wrote it. The Greek of 1 Peter is better than the Greek of 2 Peter, right? So it can't be Peter who wrote it. The Greek is completely different. Right? There is no way Peter could have written 2 Peter. Okay, you understand the objection? Well, let's see if there is a logical explanation, logical explanation for why 2 Peter's Greek would be so different from the Greek of 1 Peter, though both letters are attributed to Peter. How can the same author write so differently and in one letter, write better than in the second letter. 1 Peter 5, 13. Here's, I'm sorry, 1 Peter 5, 12. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 12. Here's your answer. 1 Peter 5, verse 12. Here's your answer. 1 Peter 5, verse 12. No, not different style, uh, audience, maybe, Scott, uh, Scott Walden. He tells you, 1 Peter 5, verse 12. Through Sylvanus... Whom I regard as a faithful brother, and we're waiting for the second part of the verse. He only gave us part of it. I have written you in few words to encourage you, in order to encourage you and to give an earnest witness that this is the true undeserved kindness of God. Stand firm in it. Sylvanus wrote this for me. Through him, I had him write for me. So there is no good objection to the argument. That the reason why the Greek of 2 Peter is different from 1 Peter is because Peter used a scribe in the first letter, and he may have written the second letter personally or used a different scribe. There is no solid objection to it. And Sylvanus is another way of saying Silas. Sylvanus is Silas. Silas is Sylvanus, the co traveling companion of Paul. Okay, did you now see that the New Testament writers did not necessarily write with their own hands, but had scribes writing for them, and what the scribes wrote down was just as inspired as the words that came out of the mouth of the apostles? Did it make sense now? So, 
Let's go back to the point because we went on a detour, right? Let's get back to the point. Just because the Greek style of Hebrews is different from the Greek style of some of Paul's other letters, that doesn't mean it's not a letter of Paul because the Greek style of Hebrews is polished and very similar to the Greek style of Luke and Acts, which is why you have even people like James White who believe that Luke may have written Hebrews because Hebrews, the, the style of Greek <clears throat> echoes very much the style of Luke and Acts. So why could it not be a possibility that Paul had Luke write Hebrews? Right? So I am persuaded and I am convinced Hebrews is one of Paul's epistles. This was the view of the early church, especially the eastern part of the church, even though there were segments in the western part of the church that had some doubts. And this is the view that became the predominant view. And it's actually even the view of Roman Catholicism. At the Council of Trent, which Roman Catholics believe is an infallible council, they ascribe Hebrews to Paul. And that's an infallible pronouncement. That means the Roman Catholic Church, for you Catholics, you Catholics who believe in the infallibility of the magisterium, your church has infallibly pronounced Hebrews is a production of Paul. And you know what? For those of you who believe the King James is God's perfect words in English, did you know that in the King James translation, Hebrews is ascribed to Paul? It says an epistle to the Hebrews, according to St. Paul. Even the King James translators believe that? I believe it's a letter of Paul, but I don't know which scribe he used. And I don't, I haven't found good objections refuting Pauline authorship. But that doesn't mean he used Luke. Though Paul, we don't know what scribe he used. You with me there? In fact, let me just tell you the integrity and honesty of the early church fathers, these great men and women of God. Did you know that not everyone accepted the canonicity of the book of Hebrews. Some didn't want to include it in the canon. And you know why? Not because of its theology. The book of Hebrews, its theology is powerful. It's strongly orthodox. It presents some of the strongest proofs for Jesus being Jehovah God Almighty in the flesh and for the triune nature of God. So that tells you that the early church fathers didn't simply accept books that agreed with their theology. To them, they wanted to make sure a book had apostolic authority, apostolicity, meaning it was produced at a time in which there was revelation and inspiration. And therefore, if it came from an apostle or from the period of the apostles, that made it more likely to be inspired scripture. You with me there? But because they were not certain who wrote Hebrews, some people didn't want to include it in the canon, even though it is amazingly orthodox in its description of the triune nature of God and Jesus being God in the flesh. This again tells you the integrity of the early church. They were not simply making up names and just simply accepting books that agreed with their theology. They even questioned the canonicity of books that did agree with their theology. Are you with me there? Is it making sense or am I boring you guys with this? Do you want to know another indication arguing for the integrity of the early church fathers and the accuracy of the ascription of names to the books of the New Testament? If the church were making up names of the authors of the books of the New Testament, Think about this for a moment. Please pay attention. 
because I'm going to go into Hebrews 1 6 in a minute. This is why I got to do multiple sessions. There's no way I can cover anything in one session. Okay. Why don't you think about what I'm about to say? Think about this and meditate on this. We know from the example of the second and third and fourth centuries, from these forgeries that were produced by heretics, like the so called Christians called Gnostics, when they produced a forgery, they would attach the name of an apostle to it. Like the Gnostics, when they came up with their Gospels, where they have Jesus teaching Gnosticism, right? They wouldn't ascribe their writing to someone like Luke or Timothy, a companion of the Apostles. They would attribute the names of the Apostles to their writings to make their writings more credible. Like the Gospel according to Thomas, a Gospel according to John, a Gospel according to Peter. You get my point? Now, notice the integrity, notice the integrity of the church fathers in their canonization of the Gospels found in the New Testament. Notice that two of the four Gospels are named after Mark and Luke, individuals who are not apostles, who for the most part are unknown individuals, and the only reason why they're popular and we know of them is because Gospels are attributed to them. Why would the church ascribe the names of Mark and Luke to two of the four Gospels if they're making up names? Why not ascribe these Gospels to prominent apostles of Jesus? Are you with me there? Why attribute the gospel of Mark to Mark? In fact, church tradition says Mark wrote down the gospel that Peter preached. So then why not simply say Peter wrote the gospel and call it the gospel of Peter? Why then ascribe the gospel of Luke and the writing of Acts to Luke, who otherwise would be unknown to us? No one would be talking about Luke had it not been for two writings being ascribed to him. Why ascribe those writings to him when he's an unknown if they're making up names? Why ascribe writings to him, someone who's unknown, if they're simply making up names? The very fact that one gospel is ascribed to Mark, a no one, a nobody, an unknown, and the very fact Luke and Acts are ascribed to Luke, a nobody, an unknown, who was, they only became prominent because writings are attributed to them. I'm buffering. Hold on. I'm buffering. Angela, this is now the third time you asked me if it's important. If you don't think it's important, sister, then you can leave. Because, of course, it's going to be important. Because don't you want to know whether these writings came from eyewitnesses and their companions? Or you don't care if they're forgeries of the 2nd, 3rd, 4th centuries, documents that come hundreds of years after Jesus. Why do you keep saying, is this important? No, it's not, Angela. I'm wasting my time and yours. No, it's not. I'm just wasting my time and yours because I have nothing better to talk about. Of course it's important. Because you want to know that these documents come from the eyewitnesses or the companions of the eyewitnesses. So that's not important, Angina. Live in La La Land in fantasy world. Who cares who wrote the Gospels? They can be 4th, 5th century forgeries. It doesn't matter. Please, sister, stop insulting my intelligence. Who thinks? Sister, you have not done enough evangelism. And I don't mean this to put you down. Let me encourage you. Go out and start preaching and witnessing in your neighborhood. And you're going to find a lot of people telling you, we don't know who wrote the Gospels. Okay. Do you see that even naming a Gospel after Mark and naming Luke and Acts after Luke or ascribing Luke and Acts to Luke, is a sign of the integrity, the honesty of these men of the church. Do you see it? 
So don't be ashamed of the attribution of Mark and Luke to two of the Gospels because that tells you the integrity of the church. If the church is making up names, like we find in the case of these forgeries of the second, third, fourth centuries, they wouldn't ascribe it to unknowns, nobodies. They would have ascribed them to prominent figures in the church to the apostles of Christ. The fact that one is ascribed to Mark and two books are ascribed to someone called Luke shows their integrity. Even, even Matthew. The only reason why we even know Matthew and Matthew is so prominent is because a gospel is attributed to him. But if there wasn't a gospel attributed to Matthew, no one would be talking about Matthew, just like no one talks about Bartholomew or Philip. When's the last time you've heard anyone talk about Bartholomew or Philip? We're always talking about Peter, Paul, James, and John. Even Matthew wasn't prominent, right? In fact, Jesus' inner circle consisted of three, Peter, James, and John. If you read Matthew and Mark, Peter, James, and John were allowed to witness things that the other apostles were not allowed to be privy to. So why ascribe a gospel to Matthew when he was a less prominent apostle? Why not ascribe it to the more prominent ones? Like even Thomas. Right? Everyone with me there? Before I move on? The point is because they were not making up names. They were being honest in their attribution of authorship. They didn't make up the gospel according to Matthew. They knew Matthew wrote it. And they were stuck with it. They didn't make up the name, <clears throat> the gospel according to Mark. They knew Mark wrote it. They were stuck with it. Same with Luke and Acts. They did not make up the names. They're honestly passing on the tradition they received either from the apostles or the disciples of the apostles. So even the names of the authors of the Gospels are indication of the honesty, integrity of our spiritual ancestors who went before us, either the disciples of the apostles or the disciples of the disciples of the apostles like Irenaeus. So you have nothing to be ashamed of. These were great men and women of Christ who gave their life for Jesus, who worshiped Jesus, even dying as martyrs for Jesus Christ. Right? I pray we can be like them in their zeal, their love, their worship, their devotion to King Jesus. Okay, now that said, can we go back to Hebrews 1 6? Sorry for the detour, but this came up because someone was telling me I don't believe Paul wrote it. Again, that's fine, but don't pontificate if you haven't heard all sides. Okay, now Hebrews 1, 6. Let's focus. Do not ask me any questions unrelated to the topic. Like this guy's asked me, do we have God's perfect words in English? Can you even speak English perfectly? Okay. Hebrews 1, verse 6. So here's a gentleman asking for a perfect English translation of God's words. And yet he can't even speak English perfectly. And I guarantee you, he doesn't know a clue of English grammar. Okay. Hebrews 1, 6. Let's post. Guys, when you see satanic distractions, nuisances, send them back to Asheron. Now let's focus. Hebrews 1, verse 6. But when he again brings his firstborn into inhabited earth, he says, let all of God's angels do obeisance to him. Now, what's the problem with the Jehovah Witness rendering of the Greek word proneo? They rendered it as do obeisance to him. What's the problem? Are we ready now? 
to go into the meat, the focus, the point of the discussion. Are we ready? So I'll make sure. Okay. Here's where I need you to follow with me. As I stated yesterday, and I want to repeat because we're creatures of repetition, we need to hear something repetitively until the grace of God's spirit, it becomes second nature. Come on, we got to get up to 200. Come on now. Okay. Hebrews 1, verses 5 to 13, is a section where it cites from the Old Testament to prove the point of the author that Jesus is infinitely better, infinitely superior, and infinitely greater than all of God's angelic creatures. It is a section which cites a litany of Old Testament passages. You with me there? So let me repeat the passages it cites. In Hebrews 1.5, the author cites, write this down, note these, we're not going to quote them. Hebrews 1.5 cites Psalm chapter 2, verse 7, and 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 14. Psalm chapter 2, verse 7, 2 Samuel 7, 14. I'm going to skip verse 6 for now. Hebrews 1, 7 cites, quotes, Psalm 104, verse 4. Hebrews 1, 7 quotes Psalm 104, verse 4. <clears throat> Hebrews 1, verses 8 to 9 is a quotation of Psalm 45, verses 6 to 7. Hebrews 1, 8 to 9 quotes Psalm 45, verses 6 to 7. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 10 to 12 quotes verbatim Psalm 102, verses 25 to 27. Psalm 102, verses 25 to 27. And then Hebrews 1, 13. Hebrews 1, 13 is a citation from Psalm 110, verse 1. Psalm 110, verse 1. Did everyone get that? Thank first, last, and Protestant believer for posting what I just stated. Everyone getting it? But here's what's interesting if you're getting it. Here's what's interesting if you're getting it. Please, I want to educate you. I want to see the depth and beauty of Scripture. So let me know I'm not confusing you. Let me know I'm not confusing you. In Jesus' name, the Internet stays strong. Okay? Okay. Here's what's interesting about these citations. The author of Hebrews is quoting the Greek version of the Hebrew Old Testament. In other words, he's not quoting directly from the Hebrew and translating into Greek. He's quoting the form of the Old Testament that is preserved in the Greek version, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. Because there is evidence showing that the Jews already begun translating the Hebrew Old Testament into Greek. And the citations of the Old Testament found in Hebrews are taken from that Greek version, that Greek translation. Are you with me there? You getting it or no? Who's not getting it? Come on, help me out. I'm going to probably have to do another session on this. Let me give you some evidence from the book of Hebrews that Hebrews is citing the Greek version, the Greek translation, the Greek that Hebrews is citing the Greek version, the Greek form, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. Number one, why would he do that? First of all, why isn't Hebrew simply translating Hebrew directly into Greek? Can someone explain why? Hopefully the connection is good. Why would Hebrews not simply translate from the Hebrew? Because Hebrews is written in Greek. Why is he quoting the Greek form, the Greek version of the Hebrew Old Testament? How is it now? Is it still breaking up? I hope it stays. It stays. Come on now. Is it okay now? What can I do? That's the internet connection.
Is it okay now? I'm waiting for confirmation that it's okay now. Before I move on. Okay. Now, let me ask you again. Why would Hebrews, because it's written in Greek, not directly translate the Hebrew Old Testament into Greek, why is the author of Hebrews citing the Greek form, the Greek version of the Hebrew Old Testament? No, someone told me told me I was freezing. Why? The yeah, the old Greek version, which we later refer to as the Septuagint. Why? Ianzau got it because it was already produced. Why would you want to translate directly from Hebrew into the Old Testament if you already have a Greek version <clears throat> that's being used? By the Hellenized Jews. You hear me there? Already in existence. So he's citing. He's citing. Hopefully the connection stays. I don't know. I'm freezing up. He. I don't know what's going on, man. I'm right by the router, too. We rebuke Satan in the name of Jesus. Ah, oh, man. This is what stinks about bad internet. I hope it stays up. I'm getting tired. Okay. I asked for the 20th time because of buffering. Be patient with me, guys. Why would Hebrews cite the Greek form, the Greek version of the Hebrew Old Testament, and not translate Hebrew into Greek directly? And the answer was, because there was an available Greek version in use at that time. The Hellenized Jews, the Jews who could no longer read or write Hebrew or Aramaic, were reading from a Greek version of the Hebrew Bible, right? So that Greek version or Greek versions were already available and in use. So why wouldn't the author of Hebrews cite that extent Greek version or versions of the Hebrew Old Testament? Are you with me there? You with me there? That the author of Hebrews is quoting the Greek version, versions of the Hebrew Old Testament, and not quoting directly from the Hebrew Old Testament and translating into Greek? Let me prove it to you. Go to Psalm 40, verses 6 to 8. Let me show you that whether you like it or not, folks, the author is citing the Greek form of the Hebrew Old Testament and not directly from the Hebrew Old Testament. Okay, let me prove it to you. Mr. Highlander, just whatever you do, do not change subjects and start pontificating because you're going to have a short-lived career in my channel. Psalm 40, verses 6 to 8. Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but you opened up my ears to hear. Pay attention. Guys, you need to pay attention. Sacrifice. An offering you do, did not desire, but you opened up my ears to hear. You did not ask for burnt offerings and sin offerings. Then I said, look, I have come in the scroll. It is written about me to do your will. Oh, my God is my delight and your law is deep within me. Notice my ears you open to hear. Okay, let's see how Hebrews cites it. Hebrews 10 verses 5 to 9. Hebrews 10, verses 5 to 9, citing the Greek form, the Greek version of Hebrews, of the Hebrew of Psalm 40, 6 to 8. Guys, pay attention here. Pay attention. So when he comes into the world, he says, sacrifice an offering you did not want, but you prepared a body for me. Wait, that's not what the Hebrew said. The Hebrew said, but you opened up my ears. But when Hebrews cites Psalm 40, he cites it as saying, you prepared a body for me. You did not approve of whole burnt offerings and sin offerings. Then I said, look, I have come in the scroll. It is written about me to do your will, O God. After the first saying, you did not want, nor did you approve of sacrifices and offerings. 
and whole burnt offerings and sin offerings, uh, offerings, sacrifices that are offered according to law. Then he says, look, I have come to do your will. He does away with what is first in order to establish what is second. Even though I didn't ask for verse 10, I'll forgive you, Protestant. So, folks, can you explain to me why when Hebrews cites Psalm 40, the version he cites says, a body you prepared for me, whereas the Hebrew of Psalm 40 says, my ears you opened up. You opened up my ears. Why the difference? Anyone know? You're silent. Why are you guys silent? I don't know. Why the difference? First last answered it. Because that's how the Greek version reads. The Greek version doesn't say you open my ears. The Greek version says a body you prepared for me. Let me show it to you. Here you go. Here's a link to the English translation of the Greek version of Psalm. Though these Greek manuscripts of the Old Testament come as in to doubt that they accurately preserve the form or forms of the Greek version of the Hebrew Old Testament existence at the time of Christ. Right? And let me show it to you. Psalm, and the Greek version is going to be 39. Psalm 39. Here you go. Watch here. Here's the link. I hope you're not getting bored with all this information. I hope you're learning more about the preservation of the Bible, the extent of and how the New Testament cites the Old Testament. I hope you're learning. I hope you're learning more about the Bible, the preservation of the Bible, the versions of the Bible, and how the New Testament cites the Old Testament. Cites the Old Testament. Cites the Old Testament. How the New Testament cites the Old Testament. All right? You're getting it? I just gave you the link to Psalm 39 which is the Greek version of Psalm 40. Okay. Here, notice the Greek version. Here it is, Psalm 39, 7, which is the Greek version. Pay attention. Okay, watch here. Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared for me. And not a can confirm. This is primarily why the Orthodox Church, particularly the Greek Orthodox Church, does not use the Hebrew Old Testament. They only use the Greek versions of the Old Testament. Did you know that? Nada can confirm. She's from the Greek Orthodox Church. Did you know that? This is primarily why... Primarily why... The Orthodox Church, particularly the Greek Orthodox Church, refuses to use the Hebrew Old Testament. They only use the Greek versions of the Old Testament. You want me there? Uh, guys, I need your feedback. I want to make sure I'm not confusing you. Are you getting this? Are you getting this? Okay. If you're getting this, why the difference then? Why is it that the Greek version is different from Psalm 40? Basically, here's what I want you to keep in mind. Keep in mind. Remember this. The Greek version of the Old Testament is not necessarily a literal translation. Okay? The Greek version at times interprets the meaning of the Hebrew. Like an English translation of the Bible, some translations don't tra literally, translate literally, but they give you the meaning. That's what you find with the Greek version. The Jews who translated the Old Testament to Greek don't always translate literally because they want to make sure that the people reading in Greek understand what the Hebrew means. 
You with me there? So what you find in the Greek version is the meaning of what the psalmist meant to convey when he said, you open my ears. What he meant to say is, you open my ears to obey your will and to carry out your will perfectly. In other words, I am sent forth to offer my life as a sacrifice in fulfilling your will. So in the rendering of a body you prepared for me, that's capturing the meaning of opening my ears. Because what's the point of the psalmist? It's not burnt offerings you desire, but you desire a life sacrificed in your service, a life devoted in accomplishing your will perfectly. Do you see what you're reading in Psalm 40 in the Greek? The meaning of the Hebrew, the meaning. Right? Ah, the buffering. Sorry, guys. I pray to get stronger. I'm as close to the router as possible. Okay, so you understand? Don't be alarmed or disheartened by the differences in the Greek version of the Old Testament. There are times in which the Greek version gives you the meaning of the Hebrew, but there are times in which the Greek version is preserving an older form of the Hebrew text. Right? Are you with me there? You're going to see why this is important. Okay, let me repeat again. At times, you're going to find the Greek version of the Hebrew Bible giving you the meaning of the Hebrew Old Testament, not a literal translation, but there are times in which the Greek version actually quotes an older form of the Hebrew text where there are certain sayings and verses and words in that older form that we don't find in the later Hebrew manuscripts of the Old Testament produced after the time of Christ. Did it sink in? I'm going to give you a moment for you to get this because, again, we're creatures of repetition. We got to hear things over and over again until it becomes second nature. Do you understand what I just said? The differences in the Greek version, right? There are two main reasons for the differences. At times, the Greek version is not giving you a literal translation. It's giving you the meaning of the Hebrew. But there are times in which the Greek is translating a form of the Hebrew Old Testament that's older, that contains certain words, phrases, and verses that the later Hebrew manuscripts do not have. The Hebrew manuscripts produced after the time of Christ. No, it doesn't make it more accurate. It just means you have to compare the Greek versions with the Masoretic textual tradition, with the Dead Sea Scrolls, and keep this in mind. All of the words of God are preserved in all of these manuscripts and all these versions by God's perfect power. You with me there? Before I move on to the point, you with me there? Did it make sense? Because this is all going to go back to Hebrews 1.6. I may have to do a second part on this section. I think I'm going to have to do part two. Yeah, I think I'm going to have to do part two. I don't think I'm going to finish all that I wanted to cover because other issues came up like scribes and production of the epistles and so forth. Okay. Why did I spend a few extra minutes explaining the fact that Hebrews is citing the Greek form, the Greek version of the Hebrew Old Testament. Why? Because in Hebrews 1.6, we've just established, don't forget the point, we just established, to correct Riaz, my brother, it's not a tangent. Tangent is when I go off on issues not directly related to the point. Everything I said directly relates to this issue. And if you didn't understand what I said up to this point, what I'm about to say about Hebrews 1.6 won't make sense to you. Okay?
Okay. Are you with me there? Okay. We just established that Hebrews 1, 5 to 13 is a section citing passages from the Old Testament, particularly the Greek version of the Old Testament. That means Hebrews 1, verse 6 is also citing the Old Testament. Now let's look at it again. Okay, let's do it again. Hebrews 1, 6, but when he again brings his firstborn into the habit of earth, he says, notice the quotation marks, and let all of God's angels do obeisance to him. Now, folks, here's the question. We know where Hebrews 1, 5 is quoting from. We know where Hebrews 1, 8 to 9 is quoting from. We know where Hebrews 1, 7 is quoting from. We know where Hebrews 1, 10 to 12 is quoting from. We know where Hebrews 1, 13 is quoting from. I gave you the list. Go back and re-listen to the broadcast. Gave you the list. The question is, where is Hebrews 1, 6 quoting from? That's the question. That's the question. So the question is, where is Hebrews 1 quoting from? Kenta? Can someone tell me? What's the answer? What's the answer? If you're going strictly with the English translation, if you're going strictly with the English translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, you won't find it. If you're going strictly, well, Zina, I was texting the Apostle Paul to give me more information to help you so you don't get upset with him. If you're going strictly with the English translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, you won't find it. Because let's look at the English translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. Let's see Psalm 97, verse 7. Paul said, Zina, you're okay. He still loves you anyway. Psalm 97, 7, translated from the Hebrew Masoretic textual tradition. Yes, Jonathan, the later Mesari scribes, the Jewish scribes, did tamper with their copies of the Hebrew Old Testament in response to the Christian use of the Old Testament. Even the church fathers noted that. You'll find church fathers like Justin Martyr rebuking the Jews of his day and charging them with omitting verses that the Christians found in their copies of the Old Testament and Justin Martyr condemning them for remo removing those verses because they plainly prophesied of Jesus. You'll find that in the writings of the fathers, like Justin Martyr, especially in his dialogue with Trifo the Jew. He mentions it. He even cites verses in his Old Testament that are no longer found today. And he says, you see what you Jews did? These verses in the Old Testament, you omitted in your copies because they plainly testify about Jesus being the Messiah and your God. Okay, now, focus on Psalm 97.7. Here's the English translation of the Hebrew Masoretic textual tradition. The textual tradition that comes after Christ, produced by Jewish scribes known as the Masoretes. Let all those serving any carved image be put to shame. Though Those who boast about their worthless gods, bow down to him, all you gods. That doesn't sound like Hebrews 1.6. Bow down to him, all you gods. Doesn't sound like Hebrews 1, 6. Deuteronomy 32, verse 43. Yeah, but daily gripe. Now let me refute you. In Hebrews 1, 5, it also cites 2 Samuel 7, 14. So daily gripe. This is why I say let's not pontificate. Just because the rest of the citations are from Psalms doesn't mean that the author of Hebrews won't quote from another book besides the Psalter, because in Hebrews 1.5, he not only cites Psalm 2.7, he cites 2 Samuel 7.14. So don't be too quick to assume 
All the citations are from Psalms. Okay? Deuteronomy 32, verse 43. Folks, this is the English translation of the Hebrew Masoretic textual tradition. 30, Deuteronomy 32, 43. Be glad, you nations, with his people, for he will avenge the blood of his servants, and he will repay vengeance to his adversaries and will make atonement for the land of his people. Does this sound anything like what Hebrews 1.6 is quoting? Does this sound like anything like what we find in Hebrews 1.6? But here's where you need my articles again. I'm reposting the links to my articles. Here's the first article. Save that link. Click on it. Here's the second article. Here's the second article. When we compare the Greek version, notice the difference. The Greek version, notice the difference, folks. Here's the Greek version. Let all that worship graven images be ashamed. Who boasts of their idols, worship him, all you his angels. Now that sounds more like Hebrews 1 6, the Greek version. Right? Do you see it? Ah, but hold on. Here's the Greek version. Here's the Greek version of Deuteronomy 32 43. The Greek version of Deuteronomy. 3243. The Greek version of Deuteronomy 3243. Rejoice, ye heavens, with him. Let all the angels of God worship him. Bam! That sounds exactly like Hebrews 1 6. Rejoice, ye Gentiles, with his people. Let all the sons of God strengthen themselves in him. Let me quote the Greek version. This is all in my articles. Do you see how the Greek version of Deuteronomy 32, verse 43, contains a clause not found in the Hebrew Masoretic textual tradition? Let all the angels of God worship him. Did you catch it or no? Did you catch it or no? The English translation of the Hebrew Masoretic textual tradition does not contain the phrase, let all the angels of God worship him. The Greek version contains it. The Greek version of Deuteronomy 32 verse 43 Contains that phrase, let all the angels of God worship it. Worship him. Let all the angels of God worship him. That is more closer to Hebrews 1.6 than Psalm 97.7. But folks, if Hebrews 1.6 is citing Psalm, not Psalm. If Hebrews 1.6, Lord Jesus protect me from error. If Hebrews 1.6 is citing Deuteronomy 32, 43 in the Greek. Here's my question. Why does the Greek version have extra clauses, such as the clause that says, let all the angels of God worship him, when the later Hebrew manuscripts produced after Christ don't contain that clause? Where did the Greek get it? Where did the Greek get it? Anyone know? The Greek was translating an older form of the Hebrew Old Testament 
an older form of the Hebrew of Deuteronomy 32. You know how we know that's the case? You know what's the proof for that? That the Greek was translating an older form of the Hebrew version of Deuteronomy 32? You know how we know that's true? Does anyone know? How do, how do we know that's true? How do we know that's true? That the Greek version of Deuteronomy 32.43 is based on an older Hebrew version of Deuteronomy. Come on. Yes, Daily Gripe, the Dead Sea Scrolls. In 1947, we discovered ancient manuscripts of the books of the Bible in Hebrew, with the exception of Esther, written 200 to 100 years before the birth of Christ. And here's the English translation of Deuteronomy 32.43 taken from the Dead Sea Scrolls. Bam, there it goes. Rejoice, O heavens, together with him, and bow down to him, all you gods. Bam, there it goes. And I'm quoting from <clears throat> the Dead Sea Scrolls Bible, the oldest known Bible translated for the first time into English, pages 192 and 193. This is all in my post. This is all in my post. So here we find the Greek version retaining an older form of the Hebrew Old Testament, which contained clauses, phrases, and words not found in the later Hebrew manuscripts of the Old Testament produced after the time of Christ. I want it to sink in. Here are my articles again. Save the links, read my posts, and use them in your witness. Yes, I just mentioned it, Soldier of Christ. You didn't hear what I just said? I just quoted the English translation of the Dead Sea Scrolls Bible that's in my post. You sure you're, not, you're paying attention to me? Here are my links. Okay, now. If someone's confused, let me know because I want to get to the meat of the matter. I'm going to have to do part two tomorrow. I want to get to the meat of the matter. Anyone confused? Or did everyone get the point? Anybody confused? Okay. If everyone got it, what's the point? Deuteronomy 32.43 is commanding the angels of God to worship who? In the context of Deuteronomy 32, when the angels are commanded to worship, who are they worshiping in Deuteronomy 32, verse 43? Who are they commanded to worship in Deuteronomy 32? Not Hebrews. In Deuteronomy 32. Michael Weiss does not translate the Old Testament books found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Michael Wise translates the other scrolls of the community, which has to do with the community rule, how they function, how they worship, how they live, how they bathe, and their interpretation of the Old Testament. See, Stephen Universe ain't paying attention. Let's try it again. In Deuteronomy 32, when the command is given to the angels of God to worship, who are they commanded to worship in Deuteronomy 32, Stephen? Who's him? See, Nada, you're not listening again. Nada, one more time, sister. You guys are going to hurt me. You're going to make me want to retire from teaching. I'll give Nada $20 million to show me Deuteronomy 32, the name Jesus Christ. Ricky D, you even hurt me worse, and I feel like blocking you. I'll give you $50 million where it says God the Father. Let's try this again. Guys, come on, man. You guys have been blessed with intellect and wisdom from the Holy Spirit. I'm not mocking you. I'm being honest. Come on, guys. 
you you don't need to be Einstein to understand this. Let's try it again. Wake up! In the context of Deuteronomy 32, the angels of God are being commanded to worship who? Please, it's not hard. Most of you got it. Jehovah God doesn't say Jesus Christ. It doesn't say the Father. It says Jehovah God. That's who is being referred. Nada did it again. She did it again. Okay, Nada, you're going to have to now quote to me Deuteronomy 32 where the Son of God is mentioned. Go ahead. I'm going to wait. Okay. Let me try it for the fifth time. In Deuteronomy 32, the angels of God are commanded to worship who? She did it again. Okay. Let's see if you guys get it. Come on, guys. Answer. You get. You better get it now. Why should I pray for your ignorance? I want to pray for you. Your ignorance is not a living person. Come on. More. I want more responses. Come on. Quick. Andre, Andre, Riva. Yeehaw. Yeehaw. Come on. Quick. Come on. Tell me. We don't have all day. Okay. Jehovah God, I will give not a million dollars and become orthodox if she shows me the name Jesus Christ, Son of God. Or whoever said the Father, I'll join your church if you show me where it says the Father. It's Jehovah God. Okay, why is this important? If you guys make this mistake of saying Son of God, or the Father, you're destroying your apologetic and the whole reason why we're quoting Hebrews 1.6. The purpose of quoting Hebrews 1.6 is to show the Jehovah Witness that Jesus is being worshipped as Jehovah. But if you tell me the text is about the Son of God, you just destroy the point of your argument. Okay, let's try it again now. Since we now prove... Hebrews 1 6 is quoting Deuteronomy 32, verse 43, a passage where the angels of God are commanded, worship Jehovah. You angels of God, worship Jehovah. Hebrews takes that command and says, that is a command to the angels to worship God's firstborn. Wait, wait, wait. How can you take a passage? that talks about angels worshiping Jehovah and apply it to Jesus being worshipped by the angels if Jesus isn't Jehovah. Do you get it now? Do you get it now? Are you catching it now? Why you need to stick with the chapter, use the language of the chapter, not add to the chapter, oh, Jesus Christ. Where did Deuteronomy 32 use the name Jesus Christ? Son of God. Where did Deuteronomy 32 say Son of God? It's talking about Jehovah and saying, you angels of his, all you angels of God worship him, meaning Jehovah. You angels of God worship Jehovah. Hebrews 1.6 says that's God the Father speaking. And it's God the Father commanding all his angels to worship the Son. But wait, Hebrews. Paul, hold on. Is this a citation of Deuteronomy 32, 43? Yes. In its context, isn't it the angels of God worshiping Jehovah? Yes. How then are you applying it to Jesus saying this is a command from the Father commanding the angels to worship Jesus? What are you trying to say? I'm trying to say Jesus is Jehovah. Hello? Oh, really? You get it now? 
You get it now? Be patient with me as I get frustrated with you because I promise you, if you last and can endure, you're going to learn the Bible by the power of the Holy Spirit and be in awe of the Bible, and no anti-Trinitarian will be able to refute you if you just learn. Do you see why I took over an hour to get you to this point? Because I have to build it up to get to this point. Right, Susan Baker? Aren't you thankful for Zena for having me call Paul long distance? Everyone got it? Before I move on, who's not getting it? Everyone got it? Okay. So then, do you see how this proves the Hebrews 1.6 in the Jehovah's Witness Bible is a shameless butchering of the word? If the context is about the angels of God worshiping Jehovah, how dare they translate the word as do obeisance to him? The context is Deuteronomy 32. Clearly, it's worship. Worship Jehovah. It's not saying do obeisance to Jehovah. So then why did you mistranslate it? Why did you mistranslate it, society? You're quoting a passage where it's clearly worship. Angels worshiping Jehovah, not doing obeisance to Jehovah. That's the passage you quote, and you dare translate as do obeisance? Oh, but it's going to get better. We're going to end it here. It's going to get better. Here it is, the link. Click on it. Click on it. Because here's what I say near the end. I'm going to post it here. This is in my article. Click on that link. You guys got to follow me. Jen Deer Singh, we got it, brother. Thank you. Here's what I put in my post. I just gave you the link. I go, that's not all. The 1984 edition of the NW2, NWT, New World Translation, has a note to verse 6, Hebrews 1, 6, which points its readers to Deuteronomy 32, 43. Look what they do. Here's the link. I want you to click on this link. This is the 1984 edition of the New World Translation. Okay, guys, click on it. When you click on it, click on it. When you go there, you're going to see at the end of verse 6 a plus sign. Click on the plus sign. Please click on the plus sign. Let me know when you do it. Notice the verse that it cross-references. Click on it. See it for yourself with your own eyes. Click there. At the end of Hebrews 1.6, there's a cross sign. Click on the cross sign. Notice it quotes Deuteronomy 32.43. Do you see it? Let me know if you see it. Can I move to the next point? Yep, Riaz, they done messed up. Oh, but it gets better. Now, now, here is the other link. Okay, here's the other link. Here's the link to Deuteronomy 3243. Here's what I want you to do now. Click on that link. Yep, the cross, the plus sign, ends up destroying them. How ironic. Click on that link. Please click on it. When you click, at the end again, you're going to see not a plus sign, but an asterisk. You're going to see an asterisk. When you click on the a asterisk, right? Let me see there. Hold on. No, no, sorry. Not here. Oh, I, I apologize. No, 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 no. Forget the asterisk. My, my bad. My bad. Hold on. Let me find it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's an asterisk. Yeah, yeah, an asterisk. Not at the end. There are two asterisks. That's where I got confused. Lord Jesus, protect me from error. You see two asterisks. Click on the first asterisk. When you go there, there's an asterisk after people, comma. Do you guys see it? 
Do you see it? So click on the first asterisk after the word people, comma. Folks, notice what it quotes. Guys, notice it gives you the following version. Be glad, O heavens, together with him, and let all the angels of God worship him. Bam! And then it tells you, LXX, meaning Septuagint, Greek version, compare Hebrews 1.6. Bam! Their own note admits that Hebrews 1.6 is quoting the Greek version, where it says, let all the angels of God worship him. They're admitting it right there, folks, in their own Bible versions. Bam! Do you catch it? There's my post again. Click on my post, save this post, study it, use it. Use it. Use it. Because their own notes in their perverted versions of the Bible admit, notice what they admit. Hebrews 1.6 is quoting Deuteronomy 32.43. Then they provide the alternate translation of the Greek version where it says, let all the angels of God worship him. And then they tell you, compare Hebrews 1.6. They're admitting to you, Hebrews 1.6 is quoting the Greek version of Deuteronomy 32.43. But in admitting that, they just indirectly testified. They just indirectly testify that Hebrews 1.6 is taking a passage where the angels of God worship Jehovah and applies it to Jesus being worshipped by the angels. No, they already came up with their new perversion, the 2013 edition. Folks, do you see how God has given you such evidence to use in your witness to refute the lies and the blasphemies against the Trinity? Do you see it? So then, you know what you tell them? Say, can I ask you a question? Say, so, yeah. Here are the notes to your Bible. Watch this. Here are the notes to your Bible. You're admitting Hebrews 1.6 is quoting Deuteronomy 32.43. I go to Deuteronomy 32, 43 in your 1984 edition. You provide the alternate translation from the Greek version, which has that clause, let all the angels of God worship him. Then you say, compare, compare Hebrews 1, 6. So you're admitting Hebrews 1, 6 is quoting Deuteronomy 32, 43 from the Greek, right? Yeah. And in the Greek, the angels of God are being commanded to worship not give obeisance to, to worship Jehovah. Yeah. But then Hebrews 1.6 is quoting that about God the Father commanding the angels to worship his firstborn. So two questions for you. Number one, why did you render the Greek as do obeisance to him when you're admitting it's a reference from the Old Testament where it's worship, not obeisance? And number two, why is Hebrews saying that God wants all angels to worship Jesus as they worship Je Jehovah? If you're right, Jesus is not Jehovah, but a creature whom we are not to worship. Do you understand the entire point of this session? I finally got to the conclusion of this session. Everyone got it? And as Ria said, if all the angels of God worship Jehovah, that includes the archangel Michael. But if now that passage where all the angels of God are commanded to worship Jesus, that shows that, number one, Jesus is not an angelic creature. He's not Michael. But number two, he's Jehovah God, the God of Michael and all angels, which is why they must worship him as Jehovah.
Anyone confused? Let me know. King of kings, as long as Jesus keeps me holy, in love with him, purifies me, as long as he keeps me healthy, as long as he saves me from trials and plants me here, as long as he protects my children and fights them for them and love them, I'll always stick with you till Jesus calls me home, till I die or he comes down. Because the Lord has called me to serve him by serving the church. Okay. Let me give you the links to my articles again. Here they are. Save them. Study them. Everything I shared here is in these posts. In these posts. Here they go. Lord willing, I got to do a part two. Lord willing, I got to do a part two. Okay? God willing, if I have tomorrow time tomorrow, I'll be here. Okay, I hope it was clear. I hope you understood a little more about manuscripts of the Bible, versions of the Bible, God perfectly preserving the original words of the original autographs of the Bible and all the extent manuscripts and versions of the Bible and how the New Testament doesn't simply quote from the Hebrew text, but the Greek versions of the Hebrew text and how Hebrews 1 identifies Jesus not as an angelic creature, but as Jehovah, God Almighty in the flesh, the unchanging creator, sustainer of all creation, who is distinct from the Father and the Spirit, and yet one with them in essence, in nature, in power, and glory. And all of this we prove from the, from the Jehovah Witnesses' own perversion of the Bible. All of this we prove from their own perverted translations of the Bible. So pray for my miracle, pray for my provision, pray for my daughters and I, for our health, for our safety, for our holiness, for favor here, right? And pray God will complete the work in us that he started for the glory of Jesus and keeps me around to serve you until it's time for me to go or for Jesus to come down and pray the Lord's will be done in my life. Celibacy, your will be done or God the companion, his will be done. He is worthy. Amen. He's worthy, right? And I hope you saw more irrefutable evidence for number one, Jesus is not a mere creature. He is Jehovah, God Almighty, who became flesh for our salvation and his love for us. Number two, the God who exists is triune because Jesus is not the Father. He's not the Spirit. But with the Father and the Spirit, he's the one God worthy of our love, our worship, our obedience, <clears throat> that we live for them. And die for them. We love you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is Yahovah, Jehovah in the flesh, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Seal us by your spirit. Seal my daughters by your spirit. Cover us by your blood and keep us in love with you, both now and forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord willing, I'll try to see you tomorrow. Study these links. Study the articles. Study the posts. Re listen to this. Pass it on. Hit the like button, subscribe. And if the Lord puts you in your heart, you want to partner with me financially, all the more, the better. Love you, and Jesus loves you more. Take care.